Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Health Effects Institute 2020 webinar series. We hope all of you are safe and healthy during this challenging time. My name is Anna Rozovsky, and I am a staff scientist at HEI. I would like to acknowledge Elian Van Vlet, who's also a staff scientist at HEI and who co-organized today's session. As you may know, we are holding five webinars in lieu of the HEI annual conference that was planned in Boston in early April, but had to be canceled due to the coronavirus pandemic. This is the fourth webinar in the series. We are very grateful that the session speakers and chairs have agreed to give webinars instead. Thank you. We would also like to acknowledge the hard work of our staff who work behind the scenes to transform the annual conference into a webinar series. Today's session chairs are Dr. David Savitz, Professor of Epidemiology at Brown University and the Chair of HEI's Research Committee, and Dr. Barbara Hoffman, Professor of Environmental Epidemiology at University of Dusseldorf in Germany, and also member of HEI's Research Committee. Before we delve into today's webinar, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. So as you see, all attendees are muted for the duration of the webinar. There will be a 30 minute Q&A period at the end. So please submit all questions during the webinar via the Q&A function. You can also upvote questions in the Q&A. If you experience any logistical difficulties, please contact us using the chat box. You can also email us at jkeel at healtheffects.org. Please complete the post webinar sur survey, which will pop up on your screens as you exit the webinar. We really appreciate your feedback. It will also be sent to you in an e email tomorrow. Registration information for the upcoming webinar is available on the HEI website. Today, the webinar focuses on air pollution exposure and brain health. Speakers will discuss the current state of the epidemiological and toxicological evidence of air pollution exposure and neurological outcomes across the life course, including cognitive and physiological outcomes measured using both traditional and novel methods. We have a great lineup today. Our speakers for you have expertise in air pollution exposure and neurological outcomes with training in epidemiology and toxicology. We look forward to their talks. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Savitz of Brown University for introductory remarks and to introduce the first speaker. Thanks, Anna. This is a, uh, again, it's very nice to have an opportunity to talk about and learn about something uh, that's important and interesting other than coronavirus for at least a couple of hours. Um, I think in, in uh, those of you who attend the HEI annual conference regularly know that probably one of the most valuable purposes of it is to expose people who are not experts to an important area regarding health effects of air pollution. And I think that particularly brain health certainly fits that category where even people who are you know, familiar with the overall literature uh, may have uh, a little bit more of a challenge in trying to make sense of the, the research that addresses particularly this issue. And I was trying to think briefly about why that, why it's more maybe challenging, maybe less familiar in part than studies of cardiovascular disease or respiratory disease. But really studying brain health has, has some unique challenges as well. First of all, there are these, these concentrations of research in the earliest stages of life and in the latest stages, the um, uh, neurodevelopment and effects on issues like autism and so on. And then of course, uh, neurodegenerative disease at the other end of the, uh, the, the age spectrum. Um, there's also a wide range of, of uh, biological and behavioral manifestations. It's not a, a, a unified or monolithic entity. We're looking at physiology and, and biochemistry, and we're looking at behaviors and cognition, and the, the territory is very large and complex. I think also the studies vary in the degree to which they're looking at a variation, subtle variation, sometimes in a normal range of cha you know, subtle changes in scales of cognition or IQ from that to the very severe kinds of endpoints like dementia or, or, uh, or autism, uh, for example. And then finally, I think we'll, we'll learn more about this, of course, through the session, but the the tools for assessment are advancing and evolving very rapidly, particularly through imaging and the ability to localize brain activity in order to study the uh, potential effects of air pollution. And so I think it's a very good time to introduce this because again, in the, the, the prediction of lines of research that have 
momentum but have a lot of work yet to be done, I certainly would put this very near the top of the list as an important area where, where we have a great deal um, uh, yet to learn. So the, um, let me uh, go ahead then and introduce our uh, first uh, speaker today uh, is uh, Dr. Mark Weisskopf, who's a neuroscientist and epidemiologist, a rare duly trained in depth in both areas uh, uh, person. Uh, he's professor of environmental health and epidemiology at the uh, Harvard Chan School of Public Health and has studied a wide range of environmental influences on brain disorders across the life course. So look forward to hearing Mark's talk. Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Sorry, it couldn't be in person, but I'm glad we're getting to it anyway. Um, I am going to share my screen here to get going. Um, so thank you everybody for putting for putting this together. So I'm uh, gonna tee up this session, hopefully giving you a bit of an introduction and, and ideally setting up the talks that will that will come afterwards with my other uh, colleagues uh, to follow. So the title of my talk is Air Pollution in the Brain. Uh, where are we and where are we going? So let's get started with that. And, and I suppose one place to start, um, a, a start of some sorts anyway, was an early paper that in, in some ways kicked off some of this, I guess, this interest. Um, it's a paper from Lillian Calderon Garcia Duenas and, and colleagues looking at uh, dogs from Mexico City after they had died and comparing also to a less polluted city um, and looking at neuropathology in the brain. And, and this is just a slide from her paper, but the upshot of what was found in this was a, a lot of sort of um, brain pathology things uh, that are listed here on the right, reactive astrocytes, degenerating neurons, APOE, plaques and tangles, tau positive neurons, a lot of things that, that look a lot like what we might find in a brain that uh, was undergoing neurodegeneration and even potentially dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, and they were far more common in the dogs that came from the sort of polluted Mexico City area than the less polluted other city. And they seem to increase with age, suggesting that um, possibly something related to the pollution in Mexico City was causing these kinds of uh, neuropathological uh, traits in the brain that, that certainly looked at uh, from, from uh, at, least, at least a first blush, if not a second and third blush, a lot like neurodegeneration and, and some forms of dementia. Um, now, so that sort of spurred a lot of interest in, in this idea of air pollution affecting the brain. And, I, and I'd say that that's not necessarily surprising if we think about things that we know about air pollution already. There's obviously a, a vast and, and longstanding literature on respiratory and cardiovascular effects, among others, of air pollution. And we know in brain sciences that you know, the brain is highly dependent on, on the blood supply. It's a very energy demanding organ. And when there are problems with that blood supply to the brain, you can get uh, problems with cognitive function and, and even dementia-like uh, pathologies. Um, we know that vascular risk factors are often associated with cognition and dementia. We know that subclinical cerebrovascular disease is implicated in dementia. So the idea that air pollution might somehow be involved through these pathways, and, and if not others as well, certainly is, uh, when, when thought about in this slide, is not totally surprising. In, um, in more recent work, though, there's also become uh, another area of interest beyond this. I mean, this is sort of a picture of, of the vascular supply to the brain, but another route has sort of popped up more recently that, that is, uh, is particularly of interest. I would say that this one that I've been discussing, cardiovascular respiratory, would presumably involve effects into the, you know, air pollution ultimately into the lungs, affecting the blood supply, and that something then gets transmitted up to the brain through that blood supply. But more recent work suggests that there may actually be another route <clears throat> for air pollutants to affect the brain and a much more direct route through essentially the uh, olfactory system. So up through the nose, bypassing the lungs and, and circulation via that route, and instead going right through the olfactory nerve and possibly back into, into deeper areas of the brain. You know, you have uh, nerve cells that are essentially kind of hanging out, sensing the, the environment, um, which is the odors you, you smell. And, and that's a pathway directly into the brain. And there's animal evidence suggesting that, that 
uh, pollutants of different sorts can get into the brain via this route. And I've noted down here, in fact, a, a relatively recent review talking about effects of different air pollutants on olfaction itself, which of course might be something one would expect if, if they're coming in and having, uh, causing damage through this pathway. Um, so not only is this a very potentially direct route for pollutant, air pollutants to get into the brain, but um, the place where the olfactory nerve enters the brain is a very interesting one from the perspective of behaviors, behavioral effects we might see. So the olfactory nerve comes right into areas of the brain we consider limbic, what we call limbic areas or, the, or temporal lobe areas or the side areas of the brain. Um, the specifics of that are less important, but what, what is important to know is that those are areas of the brain that, one, are highly implicated in Alzheimer's disease, temporal lobe areas of the brain, so certainly potentially of interest for dementia and Alzheimer's. But the limbic system is also sort of thought of as kind of the emotional regulation center of the brain. So this also raises the possibility that other functions, not just sort of what we might consider as typically cognitive or, or, or memory functions, but um, sort of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, are, are potentially immediately at risk. Of course, this is a path that it might then go to anywhere in the brain, but these are sort of the first areas that might be hit if pollutants are coming in through this area. So once in the brain, by whatever route, we, we know from various work that there's a whole lot of effects that air pollutants can have, whether coming in through a uh, systemic pathway on the right here um, and causing systemic inflammation, possibly damaging the blood-brain barrier that's supposed to keep a lot of stuff out of the brain and protect the brain, leading ultimately to altered neurotransmitter levels, the signals that neurons communicate with in the brain, and also, of course, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, protein aggregation, and ultimately neuron death in the, in the, in the brain. And these are all things that, that can happen and have been shown to happen, and all the things that I've boxed in red here are negative consequences of particular exposure that, that are evident in many neurodegenerative diseases and psychiatric diseases. So the sort of um, uh, mechanistic side of what might be happening um, with air pollutants is, is definitely there. There are plenty of pathways by which um, adverse effects could be happening from these types of exposures. Um, there we go. So, so given that <clears throat> sort of quick background of, of the biology of this, where are we with the epidemiology on uh, brain effects of air pollutants? So uh, not that long after that first paper of the dogs in Mexico City that I showed you, there began to appear some epidemiology studies in humans of brain effects, and the first ones really more or less were cognitive effects of um, different types of air pollutant exposures. One of the first papers is shown on top here by a German group that was looking at a CIRAD score, which is sort of a battery of cognitive tests that are geared towards the types of functions that are affected in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and what they showed with this graph here on the left on the top is that um, the, the closer one lived to a roadway, here on the right this is less than 50 meters, and on the left here is more than 100 meters away from a roadway, the worse one's performance on this CIRAD battery of tests was. So closer to the roadway, presumably more traffic pollution, worse cognitive performance. Uh, JC Chen, at, uh, now at USC, and Joel Schwartz from Harvard, also at the same time we're looking at <coughs> uh, NHANES data, I believe this was, to um, assess uh, uh, association of, of different cognitive test scores with different pollutants. And, and here they were looking at a variety of tests, uh, subject, subject, uh, sorry, a symbol digit substitution test, uh, other tests of this sort that are, these three different tests here are, are kind of executive function or working memory type planning type tests. And what they found is while they had no association with PM10, um, particular matter of size 10, um, they did see worse cognitive performance with higher ozone levels and 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 numbers that you know ranged on the average of what you might see for three to five years or so of age on these tests so not not totally insignificant um, i also uh, with uh, former student melinda power looked at um, cognitive function in the normative aging study which is a, a long-standing cohort of uh, elderly men in the greater boston area that's been going on since the 60s um, and we looked at um, maps of black carbon with Joel Schwartz, uh, black carbon as a tracer for traffic pollutants in the greater Boston area with a map up in the upper right here 
uh, showing that with red, red being higher levels, green being lower levels, and looked at where these men lived and their performance on the mini mental state examination test, which is a uh, really a screening test for dementia, as well as sort of a global collection of other, other tests that they were doing, and generally found that the higher their residential exposure to black carbon, the worse their performance on the MMSC or the, or the global cognition test was. Um, and I'll say that th those were just a few, and I, this is a this is slide just shows of several reviews now that have come out on this question of air pollution and cognitive function. And, and I did this sort of quickly and dirtily, and this may not capture everything, but I think it captures the general uh, pattern of <clears throat> publications on this topic that, as you can see, have sort of trickled along, but have de definitely been picking up. So this is an area that's getting a lot more attention. Um, and uh, these reviews are all, all addressing that issue. So it's certainly something that's up and coming, and I think if you went into 2019, it would get even higher than this. But I mentioned back before, in terms of that route through the nose uh, for air pollutants to get into the brain, that one of the immediate areas you would hit through that pathway is one that's very relevant for mental health or emotional regulation. And so. Um, uh, several people, and <clears throat> myself included, have wanted to look at that possible connection. And shown here is an early paper that, again, I did with a former student, Melinda Power, now at George Washington University, um, looking at anxiety symptoms uh, among nurses in the nurses health study in relation to uh, particulate matter exposure at their, at their residence. Um, and, and briefly, what we're seeing here in this graph is that we didn't see much association with uh, the coarser fraction of particulate matter. <clears throat> but for PM 2.5, we did see associations between higher levels at their residence based on a spatiotemporal map of these exposures and uh, worse scores on an on a, um, anxiety symptom scale. And uh, I won't get into detail, but you know whether we looked at exposure over the last month, the last year, or sort of the 15 or so years of data that we had, um, we did a few other tests that seemed to suggest it was in fact for anxiety, the shorter term exposure, the, the more recent one month exposure that seemed to matter. Um, and that, that will be important as I come back later to some issues around timing when we think about how we do the epidemiology of these kinds of studies. But we can also look at studies looking at anxiety and, and depression, these mental health symptoms. Again, many reviews have come out relatively recently on, on these kinds of topics of air pollution and mental health. And as you can see, just like cognitive function, these publications are picking up uh, and, and becoming more common. <clears throat> um, so with that, let me just step back for a second, back to the biology a bit on that slide where I showed you sort of many different things that can kind of go wrong or happen in the brain when air pollution um, uh, hits it. Uh, I want to focus for the moment on one very particular cell type in the brain, and that is the microglia, which was on that earlier slide, but I want to delve into it a little bit more here <clears throat> because it, it's, it's one cell type that I'm in fact particularly interested in uh, at the moment, and, that, and that's in part because these microglia are, they're the innate immune cell of the brain, right? So they're sort of there and kind of the frontline response to, to traumas of different sorts, and certainly air pollution uh, would fall into that. Um, and one of the things that is becoming more clear now as inflammation occurs, these cells get activated, is that one of the things they do is they go around and they sort of engulf neurons, and in particular, the connection between neurons. And, and they play a very fundamental role in kind of um, disassembling, if needed, the connection between two neurons. So if you imagine down here in the bottom two panels <clears throat> that you get into late stage or early stage Alzheimer's and eventually late stage Alzheimer's disease or cognitive problems, that if these cells are kind of engulfing these, these connections between neurons and then in fact ultimately becoming activated toxically, let's say, to the point where they will eventually, in fact, kill the neuron itself. It's one potential mechanism by which you can sort of disrupt brain activity and ultimately kill brain cells um, and lead to sort of neurodegenerative processes. So that's one of the things I pointed out in the earlier slide. But what's also gaining more attention and understanding now is that these cells play a fundamental role in brain development as well. So there's, there's more and more understanding now that the immune, immune molecules in general play a critical role in brain development. And, and one of the very important things that happens as the brain is developing is that connections between cells are kind of over-established and then sculpted back to sort of the correct adult 
uh, system to be able to handle environmental inputs. And the classic example of that won the Nobel Prize in 1981, where inputs from the left eye and the right eye to the brain start out in the immature animal completely overlapping and, and jumbled. And through activity and seeing, you know, visual uh, perception, they get sculpted into columns where each column in the brain responds to one eye or the other. And it turns out that we understand now that microglia are critical to this kind of sculpting back and patterning of correct neural inputs. And these kinds of patternings, among other things, when they go wrong, one of the things we think uh, it may be happening from that are, are developmental brain disorders such as autism. So the idea now that air pollutants might trigger somehow uh, effects in these microglia disrupting brain development is also a potentially very interesting angle of work. And a lot of people have started, whoop, wrong direction, have started to look at air pollutants in relation to neurodevelopment. Um, and uh, one of these is autism. Uh, this is a study that I did with colleagues in Israel looking at um, autism among a little over 2,000 autism cases in the central Tel Aviv area and traffic related air pollution. And uh, what you see on the right here is that in the postnatal nine months, higher exposure to traffic pollution seem to be related to more autism spectrum disorder in these kids. Um, now you may be noticing here too, the oddity of this pregnancy air traffic air pollution potentially looking protective somehow for autism. And we've explored this more and think that something that may be going on here is something known as live birth bias. And we've published some papers on this. And, and I raise this only because um, I, this is an issue that I think is pervasive in, in a lot of what we're going to be doing here and needs to be very carefully thought about in terms of the epidemiology, which I'll get into in a little bit. So again, even with this neurodevelopment and air pollution studies, the literature here has been growing as well, several reviews shown here. But again, it's definitely on the rise and, and more and more of these are, are coming out. So, so where are we and where are we going now? So you know, that's sort of the lay of the land. And I'd say that uh, as we move forward and where we're going, there, there's some issues we really have to focus on uh, as, as this has started to gain in, in momentum. And certainly for the epidemiology, there's very important methodological issues that we need to be keeping in mind as we're doing these kinds of studies. Of course, everyone always thinks of confounding. It's, a, it's definitely a big issue here, in particular things like socioeconomic status. So you know, we have to do, take all the tools we have to address this. Um, there are some things that I think can help a lot, something known as negative control exposures, but not going into the details of that, it does depend a lot on sort of timing. When you have exposure, if, if exposures in very specific time periods matter, uh, it's a little bit more amenable to these kinds of approaches. That's not always the case. Cognition, late life cognition may be dependent on long-term exposures to things. Um, but it is worth pointing out in terms of that late life cognition that it seems like decline in cognition is a little less susceptible to socioeconomic confounding than just cross-sectional, meaning one-time shot at looking at someone's performance, which can be very dependent on a whole lot of socioeconomic factors. Um, and then I also raise here just the issue of how we decide to, uh, uh, which, what exposure we decide to look at can affect how, how exposures might be confounded by other things. Then secondly, there's this issue of selection biases, which is in fact what I think is going on with that live birth bias and why traffic pollution appeared potentially protective for autism during pregnancy. And this is an issue that relates to who gets into your study. And so in the case of live birth bias, the issue is um, in order to do the analysis, you have to have a live born child. And if the exposure you're interested in affects that, whether someone gets to be live born, you can have biases that creep in. And this also happens in the late life setting when we look at cognitive function and try and follow people over a long period of time to see how their cognitive function develops, people drop out. If that loss is related to exposures, we can get problems and in fact can even get paradoxical results. Um, additionally, dose response relations. So far, people have generally looked only at you know, assumed linear dose responses. I think we're gonna need to perhaps be a little bit more refined in that. And then very importantly for cognition, we really have to recognize that dementia can be at, at older ages, a very common outcome. And that kind of changes some of the ways we, we have to think about the epidemiology we do. In part, for example, that when you're just selecting controls, um, the likelihood you might actually have a case in there is much, is much uh, more possible. And I, I, there are other issues that come up that I think our following, one of our following speakers is gonna address as well.
So in addition with the epi, I think there's a lot more to be done on the exposure side. What, what pollutants are we talking about? Specific ones, is it, uh, or, or specific sources, or is it mixtures of pollutants? There's a lot of interest in ultrafines now, which I certainly think is a valid interest, and it's just difficult at this stage because we don't have great exposure measure on the ultrafines, but we, I think, need it. Um, and then very importantly is when does exposure matter? Um, most of the late life cognitive function has generally looked at exposures, you know, averaged over say the year, well, roughly around the time they're taking the cognitive function measures. But, you know, it could be that early life exposures are important, that exposures at particular times are important, and, and much more detail to that is going to have to be paid. Um, and then that just our outcomes are very heterogeneous. Autism is phenotypically heterogeneous. Cognitive profiles are different types of functions that are mediated by different parts of the brain. Effects may be specific to certain areas. They may be more general. And how do we categorize dementias? There, it's a, it's a broad uh, behavioral phenotype. And then also pathologies vary a lot on the underlying dementia. Um, this is a, just a quick slide. I think you'll see something like this too. But on the top, when you have clinically diagnosed dementia, you know, sometimes you have pure Alzheimer's pathology. Sometimes you have none, actually. And other times you have different types. And most of the time, you've got a mixed pathology. So uh, how does the pathology reflect the disease is, a, is an important question. <clears throat> and even in people who do not have clinically diagnosed dementia, we often see lots of different pathologies in the brain. So what is that behavior pathology relation is uncertain. One of the ways we can try and get at this, and you're gonna see some of this later in this session, is, is with brain imaging. I think it's a very important avenue to be pursuing. Gets at the target tissue in living humans. We can assess many types of variables, specific areas of the brain. Um, very important to do, possibly looking even at microglia. Um, but we also have to consider that you know, it's hard to do. It, there's a lot of cost, access is difficult. Um, the possibility of potentially pursuing some lower tech approaches like the acoustic startle reflex or functional near infrared uh, spectroscopy are also of interest. Uh, monitoring extracellular vesicles in, in peripheral blood is an area of great interest of mine as well. And we have to keep in mind that the brain is you know, built to respond to the environment. So changes are likely to be seen. So what is, what is pathological and what is just a response? And I think part of uh, what we need to do is parallel this with sort of known clinical problems. And definitely keeping in mind that pathology does not always equal behavior. And then lastly, what you're also going to see in a little bit is animal studies. And, and of course, these are you know, truly uh, experimental. This is an example that you may even see later from uh, Debbie Corey Selecta's group on ultrafines and brain effects. Um, and you know, obviously, with animals, we can do absolute true experiments, which is tremendously valuable. We, of course, need to consider you know, what is the correct animal model? What's the translation to humans? Um, ideally, we would parallel it with human neuropathology. Um, but there's always going to be some questions of that translation. Are the exposures exactly the same? That may be a drawback, but it may be a plus because we can isolate very particular exposures and try them and see what happens. And that's the same with timing. We can get, you know, maybe the timing isn't exactly the same. On the other hand, the advantage is we can target very specific windows and, uh, uh, and try and see the effects at, at different time points in ways that you just can't do in, in the human. So overall, I, I would say the summary is we, there's definitely growing evidence that something is going on here of effects of air pollutants on the brain um, for neurodevelopment, mental health, cognitive function, even, and I didn't mention potentially Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, other, other neuro, neurological conditions. Um, and frankly, the future is, is going to be multi-pronged. We need to bring all of these approaches to address these questions refine the epidemiology, both in terms of exposure timing and outcomes, but very importantly, these methodological issues. And I think our next talk, you're gonna get much more detail on that. Um, but then also bringing the power of imaging and other biomarker approaches um, that also are not immune to these epi methods issues. We need to pay attention to that, um, but still they will be very powerful in being able to image the human brain in vivo um, and animal studies as well. So I think all of these are gonna be needed to uh, address what's a very, very complex problem. And so with that, I'll just thank the group that I work with and collaborators, including Melinda Power, Marianthi Anakimutsoglu, Ranan Raz, and, and Jennifer Weave, who is your next speaker. So all of these people have certainly contributed to my thinking and, and a lot of the work that I've done. So thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Mark. That is a great uh, introduction to a, a big, complicated uh, topic, but I think you, you, you touched on a number of important themes that I think other speakers will be addressing and that uh, will, will come up probably in the discussion as well. It's also a, a good sign on these meetings. You get the rare opportunity to see the audience size, and it wasn't shrinking during your talk, so you should feel good about that, I guess. Um, the, uh, the next speaker is uh, Jennifer Weave. Uh, is, uh, she's an associate professor of epidemiology at uh, Boston University School of Public Health and has really been a pioneer in the area of environmental influences on uh, dementia, uh, including air pollution, but also extending to a number of other factors and is really uh, one of the few people, I think it's a growing number, interested in aging and in uh, environmental factors and their influence. So. Uh, let me turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, David, and thank you, Mark, for that helpful introduction. So some of the ground that I'll be covering in this presentation includes just explaining what dementia is and also going into a bit of detail about the challenges that we face in trying to investigate air pollution as a cause of dementia. Just trying to get my slides to work. Ah, here we go. So dementia is essentially a syndrome of deficits in cognitive ability. So if we think of cognitive function as lying on a spectrum, uh, dementia is really about this lower part of the spectrum. And in fact, it's specifically deficits in memory and perhaps other cognitive abilities to the extent that a person's ability to carry out the tasks of, of everyday life are affected. Now, I want to put dementia in the context of other measures that we use in our research on dementia. And um, what you're seeing here are the trajectories over a lifespan of four hypothetical people. Um, everyone starts out early in life with poor cognitive abilities, as we all know, uh, and then these cognitive abilities improve over life. And then as we age, some of us may start to decline in our abilities. And in fact, this is what leads to some key measures that we use in these studies, including cognitive level, for example, comparing people's ability in late life according to their air pollution exposure, the rate at which they decline, and then also these two, um, well, these two outcomes clearly relate to a person's risk for developing dementia. The faster you decline, the lower your cognitive ability, the more likely it is you will develop dementia. And in fact, all three of these outcomes and also imaging outcomes are key parts of our sort of toolbox in investigating air pollution in relation to dementia risk. Now, in spite of what you may hear on late night television, in fact, no drug has been shown to alter the clinical course of Alzheimer's dementia. Alzheimer's is one of the most common causes of dementia. And um, by altering the clinical course, we mean that people are not cured, their cognition does not improve. And this is in spite of many drugs being evaluated. Now, it, I want to home in on one particular kind of agent, and these are anti-amyloid agents, agents that go after the in a person who has Alzheimer's. Um, these agents are actually quite effective at reducing amyloid, but interestingly, they do not seem to really stall the pace of cognitive decline in a meaning meaningful way. And this may be because, and this is something Mark mentioned, that most people who have what we call clinically Alzheimer's dementia have multiple pathologies in their brain that may be contributing to that dementia. So it's not just amyloid beta and tau tangles, but often it's also cerebral vascular disease, Lewy body disease, and perhaps, and, and we are discovering more and more pathologies as over time as we develop stains for them. And this is, this is a sort of recapturing of the, the figure that Mark showed you. Um, a group in, at Rush, Rush University in Chicago has a clinical pathological cohort. Everyone is evaluated for dementia on a regular basis, and when they die, they undergo brain autopsy. Now, 
Of the 447 people who were known to have, were classified as having Alzheimer's dementia before they died, uh, what you can see here is this idea of a pure Alzheimer's disease here in this little green box is quite rare in these people. What's much, much more common are these combinations of pathology Alzheimer's, plaques and tangles, plus something else. And this may be one of the challenges in developing drugs but we're here talking about air pollution. In fact, this is one of the things that makes air pollution uh, appealing um, in a sort of bizarre fashion as a risk factor for dementia. In fact, air pollution's effects may be pleiotropic and not just affecting amyloid beta plaques and tau tangles, but a host of other processes that are probably involved in dementia, and Mark went over those in detail. Um, and these could be direct effects on the brain, but we shouldn't also we shouldn't forget air pollution's effects in the periphery. Its effects in the cardiovascular system, for example, and in fact, these effects may also be relevant to the development of dementia. Now, where does the science sit on this? And, and by the state of the science, I'm I'm not going to be focusing on animal data. I would certainly take questions on that. I'm going to be focusing on the epidemiology because it is ultimately humans who suffer from impaired cognition and uh, the consequences of that. And what I'll be showing you is an update to a systematic review my colleagues and I uh, published several years ago. We are in the process of updating that now, and uh, you will be seeing the most current results of that update. And what we covered were these sort of canonical outcomes in dementia epidemiology. We identified 15 studies that compared cognitive level so cognitive performance across levels of exposure to different air pollutants. We identified five studies that instead used longitudinal rate of cognitive decline as their outcome. We identified 10 studies that evaluated risk of dementia in relation to exposure. Two additional studies also looked at um, mild cognitive impairment or other measures of impairment. And these are essentially, you can envision as sort of a milder form of impairment, whereas dementia is at the bottom of that spectrum. Uh, mild cognitive impairment would be at a sort of higher threshold. And finally, there are now six studies evaluating air pollution in relation to a suite of markers on brain imaging. And those markers include cerebral vascular um, indices as well as measures of atrophy or, or cellular death. Those studies occurred in many locations across the world. I, I, it's probably easier to tell you who was missing here. Um, there have been no published studies in South America, Australia, um, and Africa. And the types of pollutants that have been investigated keeps growing over time. Um, all the fractions of particulate matter are represented. Um, black carbon, the oxides of nitrogen. Um, there have been numerous studies on uh, exposures to traffic related air pollution. Uh, there is a growing number of studies on ozone. And what is just appearing on the horizon now are studies of wood smoke and of species within particulate matter. Now, most studies evaluated at least one of these dementia-related outcomes and at least one exposure. And most of those studies reported an adverse association between one of these pairs, one exposure and one outcome, if not multiple adverse associations. And where the, the findings were most consistent, um, the consistent findings tended to, uh, tended to involve uh, fine particulate matter, so PM2.5, and also oxides of nitrogen. And in terms of the, the outcome side, consistent findings usually involved level of cognitive function, dementia risk, and infarcts on MRI. Now, where these findings are mixed or much more sparse, um, those findings involve PM10, co the coarse fraction of PM, ozone and sources of PM or other pollutants. On the outcome side, inconsistent or sparse findings, and you kind of saw this too, uh, involved cognitive decline and other MRI outcomes. And I should say the inconsistency around other, other MRI outcomes 
partially relates to the fact that there were so many things we can measure on MRI or brain MRI. And so there are, there's not a lot of overlap across studies in the kinds of measures that are selected. Although infarcts is a very, very common measure and it's present, I think, in all, um, almost all the studies conducted. So is this good enough? We have a lot of epidemiologic data now. Um, we've studied a lot of people in a lot of locations. And are we ready to apply these results to advising people about their risk? Are we ready to apply these results uh, to changing, say, regulatory standards? And in fact, uh, the ISA, the, um, the EPA's uh, Integrated Science Assessment of Particulate Matter recently um, issued a judgment that perhaps long-term exposure to fine PM is related to nervous system effects. This is a broad category of nervous system effects. Well, I want to go over some challenges that we face and some reasons that we may want to continue researching this question in perhaps um, improved ways. So the first thing I want to address are studies of dementia. There were 10 studies of dementia. And of those 10, six used insurance claims or medical records to identify people who had dementia and people who did not. Two of those studies partially relied, relied on these claims and medical records. The other two uh, relied solely on what we call uniform standardized assessment. So every participant in the study underwent an evaluation that looked the same. Um, and in many cases, they went, underwent this evaluation on a regular basis. So they were not relying on um, the medical care system to pick up cases. Now, I just, I can't really do an interactive quiz because of this platform. So this is just be something you can do for yourself. So I, I want to ask uh, what the positive predictive value is of medical records and insurance claims for classifying people with dementia. So essentially what this means for people who don't speak this language, if I show you an insurance claim, a Medicare claim, for example, of someone who uh, has dementia, I'm sorry, the, the claim says they have dementia. The claim says you know, this person was visiting the clinic and the reason was dementia. What is the probability that that person actually has dementia? And here are your options. So um, they range from a very high probability, this person is very likely to have dementia. That claim actually indicates they have dementia, all the way down to 56%. Um, you know, it's like they might or they might not. And what is very sobering, has been very sobering to learn, is that the positive predictive value is, is in the 50 to 60% range, depending on, on the kind of data we're using. And of course, what's easy to, uh, an, e an easy response to this is that this is, these are US studies. The US um, doesn't really have the kind of integrated system that other countries have. And in fact, this is a problem everywhere. And it's even worse if we try to evaluate dementia types, so vascular dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, um, other kinds of dementia. So, so in fact, there's quite a bit of error associated in, um, uh, with, with, with classification of dementia in these data, in spite of the fact that often we can get a lot of data from these sources. So here's what, here's what this looks like, and I'm just going to delve a little bit further. Um, this is a study uh, that was conducted in the Health and Retirement Study, which is based in the United States. And a subset of these participants underwent uniform evaluations for dementia. And then what happened is investigators went to their Medicare claim data and they looked for who had and did not have evidence of a dementia diagnosis in those data. So about 10 to 20 percent of participants had by this assessment that researchers conducted. They, they were determined to have dementia. 85 percent of them had evidence of a diagnosis in their Medicare claims. So a sensitivity of 85%. Now, most people, and this is true of the population, did not have dementia. In fact, dementia is not a normal part of aging. And those people, or 89% of those people, did not have evidence of a dementia diagnosis in their Medicare claims. So a specificity of 89%. Now, because the majority of the older adult population does not have dementia in spite of our fears about developing dementia in our old age. Most, or not most, but a lot of those positive claims were from people who didn't have dementia. So this is where this positive predictive value comes from. 
this positive predictive value is not so poor for other common outcomes of older age, but it is especially and frustratingly low for dementia. Now, sure, there's misclassification, but does it really matter? We still, I mean, if you use these data sources, we can get so much data. Well, it is a problem if the misclassification of dementia depends on someone's level of exposure to air pollution. And this is how this could work. So a person is likely to get a dementia diagnosis if they actually have dementia, and that's a good thing. But you know, a dementia diagnosis partially involves clinical interaction. And we can imagine that perhaps if they are already under the attention of a clinician, perhaps for a condition like cardiovascular disease, that that dementia is more likely to be picked up and diagnosed. And I'm picking out cardiovascular disease for reasons that you probably understand, which is that cardiovascular disease risk is influenced by air pollution exposure. And so the upshot of these sort of diagnostic patterns in the community is that if we use this kind of data for our dementia um, diagnoses, we could end up overestimating air pollution's adverse effect on dementia. Now, a second challenge that we deal with, with that Mark touched on is selection bias. And um, one example is um, from studies that, that are conducted over the long term, these long term cohort studies of aging. And I will tell you that when you are old, it is, you know, you have the freedom of time often to involve yourself in these studies. But if you are ill, it can be very challenging. And so, in fact, many of these studies involve a segment of the population that in fact may have better cognitive function and uh, than their cohorts in the community. And we know that, that higher cognitive function is associated with reduced dementia risk and lower risk of cognitive decline. Now, if selection also involves people who are exposed to lower levels of air pollution, what happens is that those people in our study who have high levels of air pollution may be there on account of their, their high performing cognitive abilities. And so, in fact, we in, induce this sort of correlation between air pollution and cognition. And the upshot is an underestimation of air pollution's adverse effect. Now, this could also work in the opposite way. And this is, I want to emphasize these sort of high burden protocols, these protocols that involve imaging, often many hours of a person's time travel to a different location. And what we've been noticing in dementia literature is that these kind of studies um, attract people who may actually be at high risk because of their family history. And so we know that family history is definitely related to dementia risk and may also be related to adverse findings on brain imaging. And in this case, what ends up being ha happening is a different direction of bias, is that these studies could end up overestimating air pollution's adverse effects on um, these sort of imaging findings. And, and you know, if this works for other outcomes in the same way, that would be the similar direction or the same direction of bias. And what's really important in both of these situations is to be in touch with the processes by which our participants came to us and continue participating in our studies. Now the last challenge, and there are many other challenges, but that's what I want to focus on. And, and again, this is, this is um, really important to consider. Um, uh, let me back up here. When we analyze the association between air pollution and dementia, one of the key decisions that we make is um, what we want to adjust for in those analyses. And the, the idea of adjustment is that we want to adjust for confounding. We want to adjust for alternative, non-causal explanations of an association between air pollution and dementia. Now, what's important to acknowledge here is that we, we have this association between air pollution and cardiovascular disease and, and diabetes. And those things in turn may also increase the risk for dementia. Um, and so we, while it may be pretty justifiable to adjust for something like smoking because of its links to SES and SES's links to air pollution, um, it may be less justifiable and it may not even make sense to adjust for diabetes because this is part of the causal pathway, possibly. Um, and then I want to also highlight BMI, a body mass index. Often the body mass index that we have available for studies of older adults is, is body mass index measured later in life. 
not early in life, uh, before all these sort of chronic diseases happened. And one of the things about dementia that's been very interesting is that we can see drops in body mass index more than a decade prior to someone, someone developing dementia itself. So in fact, um, BMI could actually be, in, as measured later in life, could be a result of incipient illness. And, and in that sense, we would not want to adjust for it. So let me summarize the state of the science here. There are definitely suggestions of an adverse association between air pollution and dementia and its related outcomes. The methods that have been used in these studies have actually been improving over time, but we still have some really critical needs. We definitely need more studies that are set in environments with uniform standardized dementia assessments, not with complete reliance on um, the medical system. We need more attention to misclassification if we are going to use these um, claims and medical records. And we do need more attention to selection bias. And I will say this is happening at an incremental pace now. We should be thinking about realistic time scales. Uh, dementia is a condition that develops over, over at least a decade, if not longer. And then keep in mind uh, adequate exposure contrast. And because uh, this is the HEI, I will go into further detail about that. And finally, I encourage future researchers to um, involve more diverse populations. Most populations thus far have been white. Um, and be sure to reach across the disciplinary aisle. It is by involving people with deep expertise in air pollution, deep ex expertise in dementia, that we can make these critical decisions and have these critical insights about selection bias, misclassification, and what to adjust for. So uh, with that, thank you so much. These are my acknowledgments and my collaborators. Thanks very much, Jennifer. That was a, a really nice talk, and particularly the, the methodologic challenges, and by recognizing them, hopefully we can begin to overcome them. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to, to my colleague, Barbara Hoffman, who will introduce the, uh, the next speaker. Well, thank you very much, David, and also thank you, thank you very much to our prior speakers and their fascinating um, presentations. We will now turn over um, to Megan Herting, uh, who will give us a talk about neuroimaging. Dr. Megan Herting is an assistant professor of um, behavioral neuroscience at the University of Southern California with expertise in adolescent neuroimaging and brain development. Her current research evaluates how air pollution exposure may impact neurodevelopmental traject trajectories of risk during the teen years. She is the 2019 recipient of the Health Effects Institute's Walter A. Rosenblith Award. She's also involved with nationwide consortia to better understand in environmental influences on brain health as a multiple PI of the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study in LA and as a co-investigator of the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes Program at USC. Um, Megan Herting, uh, we're um, thrilled to have you here and uh, hear your talk. Great, thank you so much. So my goal for today is to provide a brief overview of the neurological health effects of ambient air pollution exposure across the child and adolescent time windows, as well as provide an overview of some of the neuroimaging MRI methods that hold great promise to detect these effects. My background is actually in behavioral neuroscience, so today's presentation really is presented through the lens of developmental neuroscience as in terms of where we can go and what's been done so far. Uh, as nicely introduced uh, today by Dr. Weisskopf, um, there's both animal and human studies highlighting that there are neurotoxic effects on the developing brain. And some of the epidemiology literature that suggests this includes developmental delays, risk for autism, lower uh, IQs, and increases in great uh, behavioral problems such as anxiety, uh, tension, or even depression in children. But there's actually a number of remaining questions for our field, uh, and, and these need to be uh, looked at in order to help strengthen and clarify some of the links. This includes things like sources and exposure characteristics that have been already highlighted today by both talks, thinking about the importance of confounders and covariates, 
thinking about heterogeneity effects, are there sex differences or differences by socioeconomic status, race or ethnicity? Um, there's also the question of which periods of exposure might be most important, uh, as lovely as introduced uh, by Dr. Weisskopf. Uh, and questions also remain about the brain mechanisms. And lastly, you know, the question that really is on many of our minds are the neurotoxic effects of early life exposure to ambient air pollution. Do they have long lasting effects? Are they going to affect us as we transition into adulthood? The latter three are what I'd like to focus on today, given my background and interest um, in behavioral neuroscience. So for the first question regarding the importance of timing, there's been a number of important studies over the last decade that have started to try to address these questions in a novel ways. For example, here are just two studies in which uh, these, uh, both Chu and et al. and Lin and et al. had looked at whether or not they could identify uh, susceptible periods of the prenatal window in adverse outcomes of ambient air pollution. This included looking at IQ in children about five to six years of age, or looking at gross motor, gross motor and other uh, developmental milestones at about 18 months. In addition, uh, more recent studies have even examined whether or not prenatal versus postnatal exposure might be important, including this great recent paper by Dircano and, and Monica Guxin's group, in which they looked at an average of exposure over the prenatal period and an average over the postnatal period on emotional and aggressive outcomes uh, at uh, seven to 11 years of age. Uh, however, they actually didn't find much of an association Regardless, studies like these are vital because they have started to point to the nuanced factor that mixed findings could be both during the prenatal and postnatal period due to the fact we're trying to capture an effect of ambient air pollution on the context of a truly moving target, which is the ongoing neural maturation that occurs at these various time windows. This is a brain uh, maturation timeline um, of some of the highlights as in, mentioned in the introduction about brain processes that happen during the prenatal and postnatal period that could be disrupted by air pollution exposure. Prenatally, a lot of uh, effort has been uh, looked at to look at whether or not air pollution could affect cell uh, proliferation and migration to the right places within the brain as well as uh, other processes such as, such as synaptogenesis or myelination uh, that occur both prenatally and extend into the postnatal periods. As uh, introduced also uh, by Dr. Weisskopf, this idea of pruning of synapses is really a postnatal phenomenon in which there is this sculpting of inputs based on experience of the brain and really driven by microglia, which may be mostly impacted by air pollution from some of the previous work as shown by animal studies. However, what's interesting is a number of these postnatal processes do not just extend in the first postnatal years of life but rather these processes continue throughout childhood and the teenage years. And in fact, these biological processes have helped us to redefine what we call the new adolescence, in which we really think the adolescent period now extends between the ages of 10 to 24, as brain maturation isn't really complete as seen by human MRI methods until about age 25. And so really there's this prolonged sensitive period in which uh, air pollution might uh, have effects on the developing brain. For these and other key de developmental changes beyond the brain, late childhood and adolescence is really a period of both opportunity and vulnerability, as there's a number of physical, social, cognitive, and even lifestyle changes that are occurring as children uh, transition through the teenage years. Physically, we not only have uh, physical growth in height, but also changes in pubertal maturation that occur on the early onset of adolescence. Socially and cognitively, we have changes in peer relationships, self-identity and self-esteem and intimacy. And cognitively, really, we are building our cognitive reserve uh, so that we may have um, improved planning and goal setting during this time, improvements in decision making, and all other executive functions that really allow us to take on daily life. 
All of these systems are undergoing development, however, as the individual becomes more autonomous and has more opportunity to choose their own physical activity or dietary behaviors and may even ex start experimenting with drugs and alcohol. And for these reasons, these systems and these lifestyle changes, uh, disruption to many of these processes, including the social and cognitive changes, can lead to la long lasting effects on both education and social uh, attainment, uh, but also well-being. And it's for these reasons that this is also thought to be a period of, of vulnerability. Uh, there's heightened risk-taking during this time, and the developmental systems for emotion reward are developing while we still have, have a protracted development of regulatory systems uh, from a neural level. And risk-taking and vulnerability during this time is also reflected in the increase in number of mental health issues that actually start to emerge across late, adoles uh, late childhood and adolescence. Things like ADHD, uh, conditions like ADHD come on during late childhood, but anxiety and mood disorders really emerge during the adolescent years, and other disorders such as schizophrenia and substance abuse come on uh, in the late adolescent, early adulthood years. Um, and so putting this uh, together at the neural level, these developmental cha uh, changes really create a, per a period of opportunity and vulnerability. But this is not occurring as a whole for the brain. It's actually occurring in a systemic fashion. So here we have pictures of brain maturation. Um, and early in childhood, around age five or six, uh, we are completing our, our ability for us to do basic sensory, motor, and visual processing, including uh, maturation of the vis visual cortex, motor cortex, and primary sensory cortices. And this allows children right to learn how to speak and listen, perceive emotions, and visual stimuli. But it's not until mid to late childhood that the association brain regions around these primary sensory areas uh, start to integrate to allow for conceptual frameworks of social, emotional, cognitive concepts. It's early to mid adolescence and even late adolescence to adulthood in which we see maturation of the parietal, so, uh, parietal cortices as well as the prefrontal cortex. And again, these are the neural systems that allow for these emotional reward processes as well as improved emotional regulation and long term planning uh, to really develop that may already be uh, vulnerable to things like air pollution. But you can see just from these maps, these brain maps, that air pollution at various timings of postnatal exposure, as well as cumulative effects, could have detrimental outcomes on various systems. And they could be different depending on the timing and the dose of each exposure period. So integrating knowledge about ambient air pollution from the behavioral realm, as well as from brain development and neuroscience, the question becomes, does air pollution impact brain structure and function in our developing children and teens? And so in order to answer this question, we've looked to the literature, which just like Dr. Weisskopf mentioned, is really a budding area for research. And specifically, we looked to see what studies had been done on outdoor air pollution and MRI. MRI is a great tool as it is non-invasive and it just uses a large magnetic field that can be manipulated in many different ways to assess many different uh, markers of brain health. Some of these that may be more common to individuals are structural MRI, which lets us look at the shape and the size of brain regions. Diffusion MRI, which allows for us to make inferences about white matter microstructure and connections between brain regions. Functional MRI uses the blood oxygen level dependent signal, which uh, actually is a proxy for brain activity and can allow us to look at intrinsic organization patterns of brain activity with resting state or even brain activity in response to a certain task, such as working memory or a motor uh, uh, task. Two other uh, lesser known but very useful approaches include arterial spin labeling that lets us look at cerebral blood flow and uh, spectroscopy, which gets at brain metabolites. And looking at the literature, um, a number of studies in just the last couple of years have come out on these topics in which they looked at ambient air pollutants uh, as well as some of these uh, brain phenotypes and various cohorts. And even the ones in red are just highlighted in that they came out in, in the last, uh, since the end of 2019. And so they're very recent work. Uh, 
It's also really apparent from just this, sub, this quick summary that most studies to date have focused on structural MRI with only a handful of studies looking at other modalities to get insight into which uh, brain mechanisms might be altered with air pollution exposure during child and teenage years. And while I'd like to say that this literature could be easily summarized, uh, there actually are some inconsistent findings as to what the uh, primary outcome of, of a deficit may be. Some studies suggest gray matter volumes are affected, others white matter volumes, and, and some findings haven't been able to find associations with certain white matter pathways or brain metabolites. So why might this be? Well, of course, study design might play a role, as is the pre-processing and MRI techniques used. But another reason that there could be inconsistencies is because of the geographical and sociodemographic differences of the four cohorts that have really led this research. Um, for example, all studies to date have come from one of these four components of, of studies, including the Columbia Center birth cohort that looked at pH exposure during in utero, the BREATHE cohort, which is a great cohort coming out of Barcelona, Spain, that has looked at traffic-related and copper uh, uh, pollution exposure on, on brain outcomes in children. And the Generation R cohort uh, from the Ro uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, which has been funded in part by the Health Effects Institute and Monica Guxin's work, has really done a nice job of looking at various pollutants on brain structure and microstructure. And then even more recently, we have a number of brain imaging results coming out of the Cincinnati cohort known as CCAPS, in which they've looked at elemental carbon attributed to traffic on their outcomes of interest. Uh, but the question about whether or not these mixed findings are of concern could also just be a question about generalizability. Um, maybe there's differences in the sources and lifetimes of exposure of these individuals from these different samples, but also their inconsistent findings might highlight that maybe there's identifiable susceptibility risk factors, such as the Columbia Center birth cohort being focused on a minority cohort of a lower SES background that could really point to some important uh, avenues of research moving forward. Of course, today we've already gotten a great introduction to how the epidemiology world needs to think about air pollution exposure and this uh, on brain health and think about things like confounders and covariates. And this is, holds true for this research as well. Of course, some of the things that have been looked at but not consistently are things like physical environment and community level factors, such as noise and green space or potentially differences in neighborhoods. Uh, genetic differences to look by gene by environment interactions. And of course, this question of parental and family factors, both from the level of, of, of a confounder, but also as possibly a mediator or moderator in some of the effects we're seeing. Going back to this question of timing, which is really important when studying air pollution and neurodevelopment, these cohorts also have had variability in when they were designed for the primary period of exposure and the primary brain scan time period in which the child was assessed. And all of the studies to date have actually been cross-sectional, uh, which uh, limits the ability to really capture some of these complex patterns of brain maturation. So for example, the Generation R study and Columbia study have looked at the prenatal periods as their primary exposure when they started their studies, whereas the CCAPS and the BREATHE project have looked at the recent postnatal or even the concurrent child's year, the year before brain scanning. And so this also really highlights that there's probably a number of neuronal processes that are impacted at the time of the exposure, but also a lot of experience and plasticity that could occur um, in terms of the outcome. Moreover, just looking at these plots, we see that there has been a focus on late childhood uh, brain development, and really the literature is, is missing a key gap of what happens with air pollution exposure during the adolescent period and even into young adulthood. In this regard, um, we are hoping to, to fill this gap by leveraging a study known as the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, or ABCD study, which is the largest long-term study of brain development and child health in the US. Uh, this includes over 11,000 children who have been enrolled in this study at ages 9 to 10 and come from 21 research sites across the country. 
Um, and there's actually annual cognitive behavioral assessments uh, each year and then brain scans every two years. Uh, and we're currently in year two to three of, of this study. So uh, leveraging this study, um, we've kind of, uh, with USC and uh, in conjunction with an NIH center grant for Harvard, have a le uh, leveraged what we call ABCDE, or the environment component, and which working with Joel Schwartz, we've been able to use his continental US PM 2.5 prediction model to assign air pollution exposure estimates at the residential addresses of all the ch children in this consortium. And we have uh, so far just looked at annual average of PM 2.5 uh, at baseline on their brain outcomes. After adjusting for multiple uh, confounders, as well as correcting for multiple comparisons, these are some preliminary, again, cross-sectional findings showing that we see both hemispheric and, and regional specific associations between PM 2.5 exposure and cortical thickness in areas of the prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate, which are important for emotional behavior and emotional regulation, as well as subregions such as the amygdala. Uh, of course, these are just preliminary findings, and with the support of HEI and, the, and our recent Rosenbluth Award, we'll continue to examine how ambient air pollution might relate to prefrontal connectivity of these emotional regulation regions and changes in mental health longitudinally in this cohort. Megan, you have two minutes left. Great, thank you. Uh, so really the question that needs to occur moving forward is that uh, we need longitudinal MRI to ask, answer the questions about changes in trajectories. And not just through the ABCD, but all of these other wonderful cohorts that I've mentioned have really started to expand their time windows of exposure and follow their kids longitudinally. And these will be really important for understanding of whether or not air pollution is leading to deficits or delay of maturation, which can't get, be uh, examined with one time point, or even possible lags or deterioration over time. And if the latter two are true, a lag or deterioration, we think that MRI might be especially important for identifying biomarkers um, before clinical problems emerge, especially for things like mental health that occur during the latter years. So even though ambient air pollution and longitudinal MRI data haven't been examined to date, we can look to the behavioral literature to answer this question of whether or not there might be long-term effects from exposure during this other period of sensitive window of sensitive uh, maturation. And these studies come from Wang and Yunin, uh, who looked at a Southern California cohort and showed that ambient air pollution during the adolescent period led to long-term changes in decreases in IQ, as well as increases in externalizing behavior and, and delinquency, as well as a more recent study showing ambient air pollution, PM 2.5 at age 12, predicting an increased odds in depression, uh, odds risk for depression. Um, but moving forward, there's a couple of uh, things that we need to do to harness uh, the power of MRI in this work. And as I mentioned, a number of studies have reported on one or uh, more of these outcomes, but separately. And really, multimodal imaging is, is really focused on integrating these methods by collecting them in the same individuals so that we can understand large connectomes and large uh, networks within the brain. And we can integrate structural connection and uh, brain activity maps in order to understand uh, large scale networks and how ambient air pollution might influence these networks across development. So where are we headed and where do we need to go now? So as a, as a summary, most studies to date have looked at single pollutant models and looked at either a prenatal or childhood exposure period. And they've usually reported on one modality at a time using a very regional based analysis. But the future of this work really is going to have to include the integration of some of these epidemiological um, advancements such as individual components and multi-pollutant modeling, as well as looking at the timing specific and cumulative effects of exposure as I've highlighted today. On the outcome side with MRI, we have a lot of power to detect um, um, changes in the brain, and we're going to need multivariate analyses and these large-scale system approaches to examine networks with multiple modalities. So in summary, um, air, air pollution has been correlated with child and adolescent behavior, as well as a number of neuroimaging uh, biomarkers of brain development. 
But in order for us to really start to emerge into this research, we have to take time to think about the timing of exposure and both the timing of the brain scan, because it's likely important to uncover how air pollution is impacting brain trajectories. And there's a whole body of work that needs to be done to understand if whether or not there are additional risk and modifiable lifestyle factors that could moderate or even mitigate some of these problems we see with ambient air pollution exposure and the neurotoxic effects. And overall, both new and integrated MRI methods can really offer insight into brain health. And we think with the potential to detect alterations prior to clinical onset for some of the psychiatric disorders that emerge during the teenage years. And with that, I'd just like to thank my lab and our collaborators for the ABCDE project, as well as our funding and HEI, the opportunity to present today. Well, Megan, thank you very much. Uh, this was a fascinating talk, and we will be really excited to see the results of um, your study. Uh, so now we're going to dig even deeper into neurodevelopmental disorders, and we will turn over to Debra, Dr. Deborah Corey Slechter. She's a professor of environmental medicine, pediatrics, and public health sciences at the University of Rochester Medical School and former chair of its Department of Environmental Medicine and PI of its NIEHS 4 Center grant. Her research has focused largely on the consequences of developmental exposures to environmental chemicals on brain development and behavior. This work has examined the effects of developmental exposures to metals, pesticides, and air pollutants in animal models and human cohorts. And Deborah, we are pleased to have you with us and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Um, as we've already been hearing this morning, there is a growing body of literature that has uh, been associating the air pollution uh, with neurodevelopmental disorders, probably primarily to date so far with uh, autism spectrum disorder, but there are also studies now reporting uh, associations with schizophrenia or metrics thereof, attention deficit disorder, decline in the rate of cognitive growth, and uh, interhemispheric disconnectivity uh, as well, which I will come back to. Um, I, I just looked at this actually the other day. Uh, I thought this was kind of interesting. If you look at the map of uh, the geographical distribution of PM 2.5 uh, in the US, it's notably similar to the residential location at the time of birth uh, for diagnosis of autism. Clearly, these could be coincidental uh, or causative, but I think they're interesting nonetheless. So I think there's several things that have already been brought up uh, with respect to exposure, but I also want to highlight that this is a lifelong uh, exposure, really. And in this case, I'm talking about ultrafine particles um, as breathed in by a pregnant woman. Ultrafine particles can, uh, their contaminants can cross the placenta. Uh, they can get directly into the fetal bloodstream. And, in the, in the dam or in the mother, they can cause maternal inflammation that damages the placenta. Once they're in the fetal bloodstream, they pretty much have a direct route to the fetal brain because none of the mechanisms are yet in place uh, which really control uh, the entry and exit of um, various molecules in and out of the brain. After birth, as we heard before, clearly the bloodstream remains uh, a source of uh, exposure of ultrafine particles to the brain. But as Mark mentioned earlier, there's a lot more interest uh, in the fact that these ultrafine particles can essentially take a ride uh, on nerves and go directly into the brain in that way. For example, from the olfactory nerve and or trigeminal nerves directly into the olfactory bulb of the brain. Um, as well as something that we haven't really given much consideration to yet, which is the vagal nerve uh, and its connection uh, into the brain stem, uh, which would connect virtually every organ um, to the brain. So these are basically lifelong exposures that, that, that we're talking about, and that could very well relate to early fetal programming and long-term effects of air pollution um, on the brain. 
So let's just review a little bit uh, in terms of autism spectrum disorder as one of these neurodevelopmental disorders, as I'm sure many of you are aware, it's actually diagnosed on the basis of behavioral deficits um, that include social communication and interaction, uh, repetitive behaviors, uh, lack of ability to inhibit your responding. However, it can include sensory motor deficits, cognitive deficits, there is also a profile of neuropathological changes that occur, early cortical overgrowth, there's a reduction in white matter, which is myelinated tissue, uh, something called ventriculomegaly, which is an enlarged lateral ventricle, inflammation, and uh, excitatory inhibitory imbalance, which is basically too much glutamate in the brain. These hypothesized mechanisms have included reactive oxygen species generation and altered redox metabolism, too much glutamate in the brain, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. The, basically, at this point, we still don't quite know um, the full etiology of autism spectrum disorder. It's also important to note that this neuropathological profile changes uh, across the course of time. And if you look up here, you can see normal brain anatomy. Um, and you can see that in the case of autism, there is an enlargement of these uh, ventricles through which the cerebrospinal fluid flows. Normally in the process of brain development, ventricles are large uh, at birth uh, and before birth. And as the rest of this brain structure develops, they essentially get smaller and smaller, but that doesn't happen uh, in ventriculomegaly, which is not only seen in neurodevelopmental disorders, but is also a component of many neurodegenerative disorders. There's also a change in the white matter, the myelination uh, of the brain. It starts out actually as being uh, greater in children with autism, uh, but ultimately doesn't change, whereas there is a growth in white matter, an increase in white matter, sorry, um, in uh, normally developing children. Uh, there is a increase in um, cytokines that is lifelong, a decrease in glutathione, which is needed for oxidative stress. Uh, this is a picture showing you another neuropathological feature, which is the white matter. This is called the corpus callosum. It's the largest white matter tract in your brain, and it literally goes from the front to the back. Uh, in cases of autism, you can see this disruption, and so now the two hemispheres are no longer connected, resulting in interhemispheric disconnectivity. So I want to talk a little bit about animal models that we've been uh, generating to look in particular at uh, the role of ultrafine particles in uh, reproducing some of these features. These are exposures in mice to ambient uh, ultrafine particles. We actually pull the air in from outside, separate it by particle size, and then deliver it to the animals. We're actually concentrating uh, by 10 to 20 fold that uh, level of exposure. It includes all of the contaminants. Um, in some of our studies, we've been doing postnatal exposures of these mice from days four to seven and 10 to 13. We do these for four hours a day, starting early in the morning. It's important to remember that mice are altricial, and so uh, they are born early relative to humans. And this particular period in mouse development is actually considered equivalent to the human third trimester brain development. And this is followed by various tissue collection and behavioral testing. And what we've seen so far is notably consistent with many of the features and mechanisms of autism. It includes ventriculomegaly, uh, aberrant white matter tract development, interhemispheric disconnectivity. There's persistent microglial activation, persistent levels of uh, elevated levels of glutamate, and perseverative and repetitive behavior. And like autism, we see a, a male bias in this effect. Um, Male-specific ventriculomegaly was one of the first things we actually saw. You can see these sections of brain. This is a control mouse uh, on day 14, so right after these exposures ended. And you can see the lateral ventricle right here. Oops, 
uh, my Mac keeps doing this, sorry, uh, as opposed to a male that was exposed to concentrated ambient ultrafine particles during the postnatal period where you can see the lateral ventricle has not uh, closed up and you can see the corpus callosum above that, which literally looks uh, very much in tatters. Uh, we had animals that we kept around until postnatal day 270, as you can see over here, where this ventriculomegaly is still there. So in some cases, this is simply uh, too damaging for the system to repair itself. So it can very much be a persistent change. There's also disruption in myelination. This is just an example, again, in the corpus callosum, that largest white matter tract of the brain. Uh, and we're looking at the percent staining in an air control animal, which is about 90% of the corpus callosum being stained with myelin, um, as opposed to a male who was exposed to the ultrafine particles during this period where you can see uh, that we're down to about 15% uh, of that staining. Um, glial activation is something that we also see, microglial. Uh, activation in various regions of the brain. This appears to be a persistent effect again. Here you can see uh, even out to day 270, remember again these uh, exposures ended on day 13, there's still a three over 300% increase in microglial activation in the corpus callosum in the males um, and an insignificant uh, slight increase in females. The males also have too much glutamate in brain. And here you can see the, uh, on the right side, this effect uh, is already evident at postnatal day 14 and appears to be growing in magnitude at postnatal day 60, slight but not significant increases uh, in the females. In addition to that, we see behavioral features uh, that are consistent with something like autism. When we look at preference uh, for a novel conspecific uh, versus a novel, another novel item, you can see that um, there is sniffing, nose to nose sniffing in the controls that is reduced by our ultrafine particle exposures early in life. Uh, this is specific to another individual and not to a rubber ducky in this case. And we find that this is also uh, correlated with a loss of testosterone in these animals. Because we're using ambient exposures, one of the things that happens is you are at the mercy of whatever the air pollution is outside that day. But one of the advantages of that is it has allowed us to start generating uh, um, concentration effect curves. And these are some of those uh, that we've put together so far down to uh, ranging from 22 to 121 micrograms per deciliter. I think you can see the increases in uh, ventriculomegaly uh, in the uh, microglial activation and the decrease in corpus callosum. There's also a loss of dopamine and a sustained increase uh, again in glutamate and some decreases in behaviors that reflect cognition and memory. Gestational caps exposure, uh, we've also looked at. This would be in utero exposure of mice. This was in collaboration with the folks at NYU, uh, where our exposures went from gestational day 0 0.5 to 16.5. And here again, you will see ventriculomegaly uh, occurring in these animals. But in this time window, we see it in both males and females. These are filtered air controls where you can see the ventricles as opposed to animals exposed in utero uh, to the uh, ultrafine particle exposure. And this is simply the quantitation of it. Uh, in this case, it's very persistent in the females but there appears to be some repair that goes on uh, in the male, something we haven't yet fully pursued. We're very interested in the components of air pollution responsible for this because by regulating components, this is one way that we can prevent these issues. We have focused on trace elements uh, as a source of those. We've already looked at ultrafine carbon particles, pure ultrafine carbon particles and aerosolized endotoxins, they do not reproduce what we see. But looking at our filters from exposure, uh, we see there's very high levels of sulfur uh, and also iron in these brains. And so in an ICPMS study, we looked at sagittal sections 
uh, of the brain. And you can see that these are um, markedly increased in response to these exposures. This is from a randomly selected brain. Um, this is also the case in the uh, cerebellum after gestational exposures, where you can see in both males and females, there are these increases in iron. We have started to uh, look at the uh, agglomeration of particles uh, in the brain. And one of the things we've also started to do is to generate atmospheres of iron uh, nanoparticles and sulfur dioxide. These are a pair in air pollution um, that uh, are typically found together. Um, and uh, you end up with iron sulfates. The sulfate increases the uptake uh, of the iron as well. And what you can see here is that the iron uh, sulfur dioxide exposures are also increasing ventricle size. This effect is bigger in the males and in the females, but here we do see uh, some increases in females as well. And finally, uh, we're also seeing increases in astroglial activation on um, both males and females in response uh, to these iron sulfur dioxide. Uh, exposures. With that, I just want to stop by saying that what I've talked about uh, are the parallels of what we're seeing to autism, but I think it's really critical to recognize that neurodevelopmental disorders, and I would make the same case for neurodegenerative disorders, uh, while they each have unique features, they have multiple overlapping features. Uh, and I've listed just a few of these here. Um, for, for example, autism, schizophrenia, uh, ADHD, there are multiple overlapping features of these disorders. And so if we think about air pollution as a risk factor, um, it, it shouldn't be just for autism. It may be much broader than that. And finally, can air pollution heterogeneity explain the heterogeneity of phenotypic expression and geographical distribution that we see? Clearly, uh, people, women who are pregnant are going to be exposed to greater or lesser amounts of air pollution on different days, different trimesters of exposure. Air pollution is dynamic, uh, so it's differing across the course of pregnancy. And so this means specific components of exposures will differ uh, for any individual across time, as well as across individuals at the same time. And these variations may very well explain why we see such incredible heterogeneity in the phenotypic expression uh, of many of these uh, particular disorders. And with that, I wanna thank uh, all of the folks who have uh, helped um, fund these studies as well as been a part of it, in particular, Gunter Oberdorster, who brought me to the field of air pollution uh, several years ago now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. This was fascinating and very interesting stuff. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing more um, from these studies. Um, so we're now, now going, um, or before we're going to the question and answer session, I will just um, uh, give you a very short wrap up of what we heard about today. Um, so we, we talked about um, multiple things, ex different exposures, different toxicology, um, health effects, and methodological issues. And I want to start out with um, uh, some lines that we have seen multiple times today, and um, I couldn't resist to draw some of them myself. So um, here on the screen, you see um, on the x-axis um, the time axis from prenatal to older age. And on the y-axis, we see, in this case, the development of the cognitive function. Um, so this is one, one of the lines that we um, heard about today and the different periods where um, the brain tissue develops. So in the next line, you see the susceptibility of the um, brain tissue. And we also heard that um, specifically the developing tissues, they are highly susceptible to adverse effects, whereas um, fully differentiated um, cells and tissue, they at, during adulthood, they are less susceptible. But then at older age, once that um, host defense mechanisms 
um, start to go down, uh, susceptibility of the tissue increases again. So then finally, the last line here that um, I drew is the exposure. And of course, exposure also varies throughout life. And uh, we might have um, times of high exposure alternating with um, time periods of lower exposure during the life. So how does this all connect now? So exam for, for example, um, at, at some time during, your, during the postnatal early life period, there might be an, a time period of high exposure and that um, meets the brain tissue at a time of development, so at a time of high susceptibility, which then might actually lead to decreases or an impact on um, cognitive function or development of the brain tissue and the, and the um, neurons leading to either a transient, uh, next please, a transient or a continuous decrease in um, functioning or development, which then can transfer into either uh, subclinical changes, uh, which we can only notice with, with very um, um, well-conducted um, cognitive tests or um, uh, other psychosocial assessments, or actually to manifest disease, which can um, prolong all into adulthood. Uh, on the other hand, we can have times of high exposure that um, hit the brain tissue at um, times of lower susceptibility, or maybe also it's, it's a type of exposure um, that is not as toxic as um, other components of air pollution. And in these cases, um, this time of high exposure might go unnoticed. And then finally, at older age, once that the host defenses go down, um, uh, some period of high exposure might translate into rapid decline and maybe even dementia. Um, so this leads me then to um, a few questions that um, came to me when looking um, at the presentations and which can guide us a little bit through the question and answer period in addition to your questions um, that you have typed in. So uh, one of the question is, um, which are the most pressing issues we need to address in research? Um, Jennifer already mentioned a lot of, of methodological issues um, that we need to solve. Um, in addition to that, where are the biggest gaps in terms of toxicology um, and neurodevelopmental um, questions? Secondly, what would an ideal study design look like? Does one size fits all or do we maybe need to combine different approaches? What can we learn from combining toxicology and epidemiology, for example? Um, then the next question, uh, how can we overcome the methodological problems of selection bias, misclassification and confounding? And finally, the, the big question, are we there yet? Uh, what are the practical implications and the policy relevant aspects of this research and um, what is and of the current evidence base? And what do we need to um, supply to make this more policy relevant um, if, if this is the case? So with this, um, I would like to um, start the question and answer period. And I would like to remind you, please, if you have questions, type them into the question and answer um, um, window that you find on the bottom of your page. Uh, and we will then, and you can also um, rate questions, upgrade them, uh, so they will get more votes and will have a higher chance of being um, posed and answered. So I guess we're all sharing our screens now. And I will start with a first question that is, um, or uh, I will start out with questions that are uh, relating to um, exposure questions. So one question was um, about whether there are any studies relating the air pollutant in breast milk 
and do we have and are there consequent effects to infant health whether anything is known about that and maybe that would be something um i don't know maybe uh, deborah or who would like to answer this question i am not aware of anything certainly in animal models i'm not sure ultimately how you would uh, track that back necessarily to air pollution exposures. I think it raises the interesting question, though, of what happens when these ultrafine uh, or nanoparticles get into the body. Uh, what proteins are they um, binding to, uh, and how does that change? So how does in vivo bioprocessing of those contaminants go on? I might, I might just add to that. I mean, I, if you, so for sort of some air pollutants, yeah, it's going to be hard to figure out certainly in humans what, what to look at in breast milk. <clears throat> for others, I mean, to the extent that, for example, metals come in with the air pollutants, you know, we do know that things like lead can get into breast milk. And so if it's coming in through air pollution into the mother, that can potentially get uh, passed on to the child through the breast milk and have deleterious effects. Okay, so there are a few more questions regarding, specifically regarding the situation of um, um, exposure in developing countries. So one question is, um, has there been any research on brain health in developing countries? Um, because most air pollution, of course, the air pollution levels are there are much higher. And there was also a related question specifically talking about high air pollution towards um, coal burning. Um, do we know anything about um, studies specifically addressing um, uh, those exposures in, in very high exposure areas? Jennifer, yeah. Uh, so I am aware of at least one such study, and I think it depends on what we how we define a developing country. But I am aware of. Uh, research being led by, or at least co-led, by Sarah Adar at University of Michigan, who has a study set in India. And I know that they're just getting started, and um, I think that that will be one place that we will be wanting to look in the future, for sure. And I think one of the things I want to emphasize overall when we think about these high exposure areas is that we have to make sure we have a contrast in exposures. And I, I still think there are, but, um, but uh, just to look at a very, very highly exposed population, we need to make sure that, that we also have someone to compare them with. Um, and I'm thinking back to the early studies of children and lead exposure, where all the kids were highly exposed and we saw nothing because they were all highly exposed. So. And I might, yeah, that's, so I will add to, I don't know if it's the same study, but I think Catherine Tane, Tane and, and others at IS Global are doing stuff in India as well. And then and then there's, uh, I mean, again, depends on how you define developing country, but there's certainly stuff, a lot of stuff happening in China as well. The other, the other, I, Jennifer's point is absolutely right about the contrast issue. The other thing that becomes interesting is that in some of these places, a, a big contributor may be indoor air pollution, like cook stoves and the like. And so how we go about measuring that and, and assigning exposure levels comparative to sort of ambient levels is, can get tricky and raises more issues. But obviously very important because the levels can be quite, quite high. Yeah. Yes, uh, I would also agree with that. There have been some studies in Bangladesh as well as other developing countries on wood smoke exposure through cooking in the child's IQ. Um, I'd be happy to include those in after the webinar uh, in response to those that are interested. But there have been some studies that I know of in Bangladesh and some other work being done at UC Riverside to study um, developing countries and specifically their cooking modalities on the child's brain health, at least for children. Okay, so there's um, some questions about uh, the root of um, exposure and um, one, um, person pointed out that uh, uh, Mark Weisskopf uh, mentioned the olfactory transmission as an important pathway for air pollution neurotoxicity on the brain. Um, and he would like to know whether, let's see, um, whether there is, what's the current state of science or is there any direct evidence from epidemiological or neurotoxicological studies that really support this olfactory pathway that allows the particles from the ambient source to impact the brain, uh, impact brain health across the life course? 
uh, there, was, there were also strong animal data suggesting ozone exposure could affect human brains. Were the olfactory pathways not important for gases, pollutants, or water-soluble compositions of particles? Yeah, so I can start, but I'm sure probably others can jump in on, on, on this one. But yeah, so I mean, I would say that the olfactory route is certainly one of interest. You know, I think in humans showing that it's actually happening is tricky. The, a lot of evidence obviously comes from animal work. Um, there is some suggestion from human um, uh, autopsy studies that, that suggest something like this. There was actually something very recently published um, by Petros Koutrakis out of Sao Paulo, Brazil on autopsies suggesting uh, some pollutants showing up higher in the olfactory bulb than subsequent areas, you know, as a kind of indicator that it might have been coming in that way. Um, but it's definitely trickier. So um, I'll let others sort of answer that. I mean, one question is, you know, it can, it, it sort of, you know, however it gets to the brain, it may be having problems. And this may direct kind of what kinds of things we might expect to see behaviorally, um, even if we don't aren't 100% sure it's coming in through there, but certainly trying to find ways to figure that out would be valuable. And I, I, my suspicion is gases could come in that way too. I don't, I don't know for a fact, but I don't know if others want to talk about that. Um, I would point out in the, sorry? Go ahead, Deborah, for sure. Um, I would point out that certainly in the animal studies, uh, there is evidence for this. It actually is nothing new that there's these uh, that, that particles travel on nerves. So we've actually known this for a very, very long time. That was how the original understanding of what brain areas were connected was done by allowing particles and dyes to travel along the nerves from one area to another. So it really isn't a surprise or something uh, all that unusual. We just don't tend to think about it. Uh, it's the same thing with traveling up the vagal nerve into the brain stem, there is also evidence for that and animal models where when you cut the vagus nerve, you can change that. So it's something that we know uh, happens. Jennifer, did you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think this question is so important. And um, I will say we there's so little that we know in terms of what happens in humans. Um, um, I. And I have a new study to actually look at the olfactory pathway and um, the challenges in doing so um, are the fact that we don't have a good way to assess what's what's in the olfactory bulb. Um, our preliminary results do suggest in humans that there are nanoparticles that uh, appear to have exogenous sources that have deposited in the olfactory bulb. We don't know how they got there. We don't know if they were inhaled or they came by circulation, but it's certainly extremely exciting to be uh, going down this path because as much as we invoke this pathway, we still know so little about it. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, another question um, addressed the issue. Um, we heard a lot about, uh, about neurodevelopmental issues. What about childhood cognitive development? Um, do we, what kind of evidence do we have for um, actual effects on um, cognitive development uh, in, in children and young adults? Uh, so I think, um, as alluded to in, in the very beginning of my talk, there has definitely been the link between ambient air pollution and IQ um, in developing children. Um, and, and it's usually about a three-point decrease. Um, but as if, if you've ever seen Bruce Lamphere's work of, about shifting the curve, right, that perhaps with uh, even though a three-point IQ difference for one individual might not be a big deal, as a population, this really puts more people in the um, cognitive disability group uh, at the end, tail end of the distribution. And so there is, out of all of the research uh, from the behavioral side of child development, the IQ findings are probably the most consistent, although not every study has found them. They do tend to be the one that stands out time and again, that child's IQ levels are, are lower. And, and I would also just add in the slide that I showed of that, uh, I showed one of my studies of autism, but I showed all the sort of counting papers on air pollution and neurodevelopment, and many, many of those were just sort of IQ or cognitive performance-based studies. Okay. If I could ask just a, a quick follow-up to that. I, in a lot of studies of the prenatal development into childhood development, there's 
um, a lot more on the you know in utero exposure than on the postnatal exposure. I wasn't sure if here if they've if it's gone so far as to distinguish between whether it's the prenatal or the postnatal period that would be relevant. Yeah, that's a really great question. So you're right. The 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 very first set of research really focused on the prenatal period. And now studies are really doing such a great job of trying to understand exposure either lifetime, which although an average for many reasons could be problematic for the timing and the developmental stages that were highlighted beautifully today across speakers. Um, but you know, I, I think that we still have the question of when, but it's definitely the prenatal and the postnatal period have been linked at this point. And so really the question of when is the timing and for which individual might that be most important, I think is where the field's headed. Uh, but there's definitely the postnatal exposure has now been shown to also be linked to child IQ outcomes. Thank as you. well as the adolescent period as, as shown by Wang and colleagues in one of the slides I presented. And just another follow-up question. Do we know anything about um, specific air pollutant species or components um, in this regard? Yeah, that's also a great question. So um, definitely has been very variable, similar to Jennifer's wonderful slide uh, showing the, dementia, the number of pollutants and dementia. Um, PM 2.5 stands out, or derivatives that are found in PM 2.5 stands out in some of the literature to be, um, be definitely a key leader, but you know, I, I think there's still so much work to be done in things like ozone and even nitrogen dioxides uh, that it's really hard to say at this point what those sources are and also what the characteristics of the, the exposure are that are driving all of those results. Yeah, and I'd say that's still, <clears throat> even in the sort of autism world, there's a lot of studies suggesting a link, but, but the different pollutants in different studies are showing up. And it's complicated by kind of the correlation between these things. And then, of course, for PM, it matters, you know, whether you're in LA or you're in Israel, right? It's going to look different, and, and that may be playing into this as well. So there's still a lot to tease out there at what's really the worst culprit or what's ha acting when and where. And can I uh, add that this is where the animal models can be really helpful because we can look at these individual components and uh, individual components in different kinds of combinations. Uh, and I think not only is that gonna help us mechanistically, but if we find components, uh, we can begin to regulate them. The, the problem uh, is probably more on the side of understanding the organic components. Uh, there's going to be thousands of those, and so some of them may be not even identifiable um, by mass spec. Uh, so how we start sifting through those might be another problem. I think the trace elements, there's already data for. Uh, iron, brain iron overload is a big problem, neurotoxicologically speaking, as is sulfur dioxide. Those two act together. But uh, I think this is where the animal models will be very helpful. Okay. I would just like to build off that too. I think uh, the animal models also equally can be helpful on the outcome side of things. Um, so I know we care about humans, right? This is, this is the whole point, but even the timing of exposure on the outcome, you know, the postnatal uh, rodent brain very much follows a similar fashion of maturation as, as the human brain. And so really it's gonna be, I think, a combination of the epidemiology and toxicology studies from animals and humans that are gonna answer these really important questions more thoroughly. Thank you. Um, so th there's a um, question to Deborah. Um, the map of the nurses' health study reminded uh, one of the listeners uh, of um, the multiple sclerosis distribution in the US. And the question is whether uh, there is anything also known about um, air pollution and multiple sclerosis or other autoimmune diseases. Uh, yes, in fact, there are several studies now that have tied air pollution to multiple sclerosis. Uh, multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease, so a loss of white matter. Uh, and you also see this iron accumulation in multiple sclerosis as well as in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So uh, we've actually talked about doing this both in a human cohort and an animal model, but uh, I think that's a very interesting question. And I think the question would be, is it, an, we don't know what initiates MS. Um, does 
air pollution initiated or can it affect the uh, progression uh, of it, which is also different by individuals. Okay, thanks. Um, so moving on to some meth methodological issues. Um, uh, Jennifer, you are being asked, um, since, since you uh, very in, in, in much detail talked about different adjustment sets and how to do these studies, um, what do you think, what should uh, the adjustment set look like for a study on dementia or cognitive decline? Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, so again, our goal when we adjust for something is usually to adjust to account for sort of things that both affect our exposure level and also affect our outcomes of common causes of our exposure and our outcome. And I'll use dementia as an example. And of course, then that means that our decision is predicated on understanding about understanding something about the causes of exposure in our population and the causes of our outcome, and also understanding uh, which factors might be results of exposure. So we really want to keep things out of the model or out of the adjustment set that could be results of exposure, and especially those that could also lead to dementia. And that's why I called out, I, I don't know if that I called out hypertension, but hypertension or cardiovascular factors would be something we leave out of the model, because in fact, we know that cardiovascular risk is associated with dementia risk. Um, and it's also why I called out BMI later in life because BMI seems to be something that is an early stage of disease. Um, we don't know if it's affected by air pollution, but this looks like it belongs in there. So, so it what you adjust for will depend on the population. Um, there are certain populations where the determinants of exposure are different than they are in others. But but in general, we can say often age is one of the most important things you could adjust for. Um, usually some kind of socioeconomic um, measure and the more the better. Um, the direction of its association with air pollution exposure may vary by population. Um, that also happens to be true for education. Sex is usually not so important. Um, and beyond that, I'm thinking possibly physical activity, but it sort of, again, depends on the population. Um, and possibly adjusting for a genetic risk factor, which again, shouldn't be related to exposure, but it actually could help the precision of your model. So, so we don't need a lot of variables in those models, typically. And, what's, and this is really, you know, brings me back to my broader point, why it's important for us to involve both air pollution experts and dementia experts, because these deci decisions are based on what we know about the effects of these two things and the determinants of these two things. It, so if I could add to that, I, I, I agree completely with what Jennifer's saying, but another, so you, you, a couple of things, you mentioned a couple of times that it depends on the population, which is definitely true. But one of the things I had up on my slides that maybe I went over rather quickly and didn't lay on was the issue of how you decide what your exposure metric is can have a huge influence on what you need to adjust for, right? So um, one of my slides, I had the paper that Tom Webster and I wrote uh, in epidemiology describing the fact that one of the advantages to ambient air pollution studies is that we're typically using monitors or models that are derived off of monitors rather than individual like a blood marker or or a breathing zone air monitor and, and that has really important implications i mean it's not as good because you're not as close to the person in terms of knowing precisely what an individual is exposed to but you actually are immune from confounding by a lot of factors and when you do that because they in order to really confound they have to somehow be related to your exposure so taking physical activity for example is not going to affect the way the model assigns exposure to a person so it so that exposure level assignment is independent of a person's physical activity and so it doesn't doesn't probably need to be controlled for. SES is a big one that remains because where you live often determines your exposure level. So a lot of these personal factors may be worth it because they capture SES. But outside of that, they, it may be better to avoid them, to avoid some of the biases Jennifer's talking about. Okay, so um, we're slowly coming to an end, but th there's a few big questions remaining. And the biggest one I think are related to um, are we ready to call ambient air pollution a risk factor for dementia? And if so, um, 
do we, how can we calculate burden of disease from um, air pollution on dementia? So this is a question of obviously um, addressed to all of you. Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So who wants to go first? Are we ready to call <laughs> air pollution uh, a risk factor for dementia? I'll, I'll get it started, but I really would love to hear from the other panelists, especially people who have more experience in the policy realm. Um, I will say that I'm just going to talk about the sort of political social dimension of this, which is that um, I work a lot in the dementia realm, the realm where people don't care about air pollution at all, or they do, but it's peripheral. And I will say having spent time with the evidence on risk factors, other risk factors for dementia, um, I would say the air pollution literature is about up to the point where if we weren't talking about air pollution, we would call it a risk factor. Um, the volume of evidence is there. There's a, there's a sense of consistency. It's not as consistent as we'd like to see, and that partially has to do with the pollutants involved and some of the biases I mentioned. But um, it's, it's, it's reaching that level, and it's reached it really quickly because of the rapid uh, emergence of a lot of studies on this that kind of grew out of other like cardiovascular studies. So, so um, that's sort of where I, I stand on the conversational side, the policy side, uh, because policies are directed at pollutants and not air pollution in the generic sense, I think it's a tougher call. Please someone else join in. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I agree. One or two more short comments. I'll just say that I, I agree. I think there's still a lot of question on like what precisely may be related here. I guess for, you know, as an analogy, not an analogy, a metaphor, I mean, there's a lot of smoke here and I think there's probably a fire, but exactly what's driving it, there's work to be done. And I'd say one of my slight concerns about the global burden issue is that they tend to sort of consider all papers a little bit equally when I think the kinds of issues Jennifer was raising epidemiologically um, make me worry more about some than others. And I'm not sure that nuance always gets captured when you try and get the global burden side of things. Okay, any other comment? Just a very quick comment that, that I think that it also, when you start to look at it for the regulatory significance, at some point it has to be reconciled with what we already know about air pollution. It, it may be an interesting factor, but is it a limiting factor for specific pollutants. And that's even as if it weren't hard enough, that's sort of raising the bar a bit further to say that it, it would somehow supersede what we already know about impact on cardiovascular and respiratory disease. Okay, well, thanks. Um, with this, we're going to end the question and answer session, but I, will let, but I wanna tell you that all the presenters, um, they will be answering your, the questions that we couldn't answer uh, in the plenary session here. They will answer them afterwards uh, in written comments. So uh, none of your questions will go astray. So um, at this point in time, I'd like to thank everybody um, listening and asking questions. And I will turn over to Anna from AGI. Hi everyone, so thanks again for joining the webinar today. Um, we're gonna make these webinars available on YouTube in the coming weeks. Please check our website for details. And we have one more webinar left in the series next week, Inequalities of Air Pollution Exposures and Associated Health Effects. Please register if you're interested. And right when you sign out, you're gonna be sent a post-webinar survey and also we'll send you um, a survey via email, and we would really appreciate your feedback um, to improve these webinars and hear your, um, your perspectives on the webinars for um, when we have future. Um, so thank you all very much for your participation, and, um, and we'll see you hopefully in the next webinar.